In this video, we are going to discuss the basics of rendering, lighting, and shadows in Autodesk Maya. So I've went ahead and created this scene here. It is a very basic scene with a uh, plane with a round uh, beveled background here, uh, a couple boxes with some blend materials on them. I've added a light and turned on the shadows ahead of time, but I'm going to back up and talk about a few of these things that are uh, relevant to rendering in uh, Maya, in case you've never done it before. So, um, the scene is pretty much default here, um, and I've created a directional light. However, most of the time, preview lights is not on by default. So when you create a, a scene in, your, in Maya, you might not see any sort of lights or shadows. And just to recap and point out again, um, four is wireframe, five is shaded, sorry, five is shaded, six is with textures, I don't have any textures in this scene, and seven is to preview with lights. Um, so make sure you turn on the seven key, but you do not see a preview of the shadows by default, and nor does Maya by default, if you're rendering with Maya software, which what this video will show, will not render default shadows. To rend preview the shadows, it is found under this little icon right here, a little, little circle with almost like kind of like a shadow on it. Um, it's up in the, in the panels, uh, render att you know, attributes over here. You know, you have all your graphical icons of certain things that you can do in rendering. And this one right here is shadows. So that turns on a preview of the shadows. Now, um, I have already turned on the shadows by default, but if you go and render this, I'm um, using the clapboard right here. Assuming you're rendering it with Maya software, mine will be different. You probably won't see the shadows. And again, I'm in Maya software, and you might not see the shadows. And that's because lights in Maya software are shadows for in Maya software are per light basis. Um, if you want shadows, you need to turn them on for the light themselves. And that's because generally, if you have like you know a, a whole bunch of lights in your scene, you don't want every single light casting shadows in your scene. Um, it's not memory efficient. Sometimes it makes it look weird. So generally, you, you're forced to turn them on. Now, if you're not seeing this at all, just remember, double check that you might be rendering on a render. Now, I think the on a render by default does render out shadows, but I can't recall. Maya software does not. So you need, again, we're doing this is about Maya software rendering in this video. Maya software. If you don't see a shadow, what you need to do is you need to go into your light, go into the attribute editor. And again, the attribute editor is found on the right hand side, or this icon right here. And you need to go into the light settings. And there's two kinds of um, shadows. If you scroll down in the shadows rollout, roll out the shadows, there's two kinds. And by default, it probably looks something like this. It was black shadows. It probably was on ray trace, which um, if you're doing ray tracing, it would be, it would be nice. But um, again, I'm going for the most basic of renders for those who are just trying to block something in for, you know, oftentimes for animation class. Not final renders. It's not for that. It's just blocking in some renders. Or something quick. Um, ray trace shadows are fine, um, but I'm gonna uh, go over uh, depth map shadows for this video. Do what depth map shadows is, does is they use a trans, uh, like a texture, and project uh, along the shadow's direction when it hits an object and projects a texture of a shadow on on the object behind it. Um, I don't remember what the default is here, but the resolution I think is 256 by default. I've already changed this to a 512, and this very much works like a texture for those that are familiar with that. Um, like a texture in a game. The higher resolution this texture is, the more detailed the shadow is. The lower the resolution the shadow is, the more grain, grainy it is. You can kind of see it's kind of choppy and, you know, kind of square and pixelated right there. And that's because it's not very high resolution. Um, there's two attributes that I think you need to pay attention to most in here. And one was the resolution, which we were talking about, and the other is filter size. So resolution controls how detailed, how sharp that shadow is. Filter size controls how blurry that shadow is. So this is usually by default one. It runs up to five. Um, and anywhere you get more filter size, the blurrier it is. So but again, if I were to put this back into the one, you can really see that low res sharpness down there. Um, and here's a, a kind of a, 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 a generalized tip. If you want soft and blobby shadows, you generally want a lower resolution and five to is pretty low and you want a high filter size. And I'm just going to do a test render by clicking the little clapboard here. And you can see it renders out a soft blobby shadow. And resolution recommended being stays in power to 2, 256, 512, 1024, so on. Filter size is whole integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 usually. 
um, is about all you need to go. Um, and again, these are for soft shadows. Now, I tend to be a big fan of not doing solid black shadows. Um, even if it's like a dark gray, that is infinitely better. Because, um, you know, if you do anything like this solid black, it's just like you have nowhere else to go for the deep, dark, darkest parts of the image. So I generally lighten up my shadow color by increasing this a little bit. And then after that, it's just play with the resolution and the filter size. Again, if you want sharp shadows, it's going to be a high resolution and a low filter size. And you can see that is a relatively sharp shadow. Looks pretty good. And you can see it is a kind of softer shadow. Or sorry, a sharper shadow that's not so dark. Now, another default that a lot of students forget is you're probably going to see your materials on the dark side be really, really dark. You guys, you guys are probably seeing something more like this. It's really dark. And again, same thing. I don't recommend, um, and there's a lot of ways of handling this, but I don't recommend having solid blacks or solid whites in your scene. You know, mix it up. You, know, you can even put some tints of color in there, but just increasing the ambient color a little bit on the material will will go in and actually lighten that dark side up. And it'll still be have a shadowed side. It just won't be absolutely like the black a void of, of you know the underworld or something. So it's much much uh, more realistic because we in the real world there's a lot of bounce light and things that hit things. So nothing's really truly that dark. So we want to add a little bit of ambient uh, color into the, into the material. Granted, there are other ways of doing it as well. You can add just add an ambient light into the scene. Um, you got to be careful with that um, that you don't blow out your scene, uh, make it too bright. But you can do that as well. But again, I'm not going to cover that particular in this video. Okay, so I have added a light, I've added shadows, I've added um, the a little bit of ambient color here. I got my scene here. A couple things that you probably don't see off the top of your thing is this thing called the, the resolution gate. What the resolution gate does is show you exactly what's going to render. Right now it's on the default 960 by 540, but as you render things in your scene, your screen resolution and your camera resolution aren't going to match. So you might get things that get cut off or something like that. So it's useful to turn on this resolution gate so you know exactly what's going to render. That is found under View, Camera Settings, Resolution Gate. And by default, what you guys are most likely to see before that was No Gate. So if I turn this back to No Gate, it'll turn it off. View, Camera Settings, Resolution Gate. So and you can turn this on and off. And basically what it's saying is showing you exactly what's going to render and everything that's dark uh, in this gray area out here is not going to render in the current frame of the current resolution of the frame. This will update based on whatever you, if you change your resolution. So last, the last thing we have to talk about here for some basic rendering is the camera settings of the camera. So um, I don't think I played with that in, the, in this particular setup stage, but let's go ahead and go click on it anyway. Uh, the clapboard with the gear up here is the render settings. And what this will do, Let's bring up the render settings and you can change render using right here. I already changed it inside when I actually was in the render view, but you can change to Maya software or Arnold renderer. Uh, again, software is the simpler renderer. It's not as powerful as Arnold, but again, if you want quick results, getting your feet wet, or maybe you're just you're more focused on animation, Maya software is a great um, alternative to not have to deal with all the complexities of a more premium render such as Arnold. Um, I'm going to go through these. I don't know. I can't remember what's the default and what I've changed, but I generally change up the, uh, the format to be PNG, though you could change this at the point when you go to save it. That is fine. Most of these settings up here in the beginning are, you know, these few first few sections are primarily for animation. Um, I'm going to skip past those. I'm just interested in actually getting renders. Here we are. So in renderable cameras, you want to make sure your renderable camera matches your renderable view, which is most likely the case in default settings unless you've started creating cameras. And again, if you've done that, you need to make sure it says, it says that camera. So if you created the camera for some reason, that's fine. You just need to make sure the renderable camera matches here. And again, PRSP for perspective, PRSP for perspective. So they match. Here's the one that's probably going to be the most pertinent to you guys. Um, the pre presets here are the image size presets as well as uh, custom controls over the size of the render. So the default is HD 540. Uh, this is perfectly fine. I mean, it turns out to be a resolution of 960 by 540, uh, 72 pixels per inch. Um, just on a quick note, if you're trying to render for print, I recommend that you change. Um, there is some defaults in here for print as well. If I scroll through here, like uh, letter, 
you can see it's going to change the pixels. And it's hard to remember, know what, in, when you, especially when you need to print resolution, what pixels are, are match for printing. Um, so here's what you can do if you, if you have a hard time knowing the pixel dimensions um, of print paper. Um, you can change the size per units to be inches right here. And you can think of this stuff in terms of inches. If you are doing print and you set, change the size per units to inches, you want the resolution to be 300. That's the only thing you really need to remember. If I'm going to set my dimensions here as paper and I'm going to make my size units per inches, I need to make the resolution 300 so it, it will be print quality. If I'm going to print in screen space, i.e. I'm going to show it on the web page or, or somewhere on the computer, you can feel free to stay in pixels. These work off of like screen monitor resolutions. Hopefully you're familiar with them. After not, just give them a few renders and try open them and say, oh, that's too, way too small. Um, you can try different ones to dial it in if you're not familiar with monitor resolutions. So um, again, if it's screen resolution, size per units and pixels, resolution 72. If it's print, I'd make your size per units inches and resolution 300. Um, again, you can type in numbers here or choose presets. They're all the same. Uh, when you're happy with it, you hit close. And again, if I made, I didn't make any changes. If I made any changes, you would see this update. You might have saw an update when I was messing with the print for, for a little bit there. All right, so you line this up, you get it all going. You say, ah, I love this view. And you hit render. You hit the little clapboard right here and render. And you're like, oh, that looks pretty good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cover a few more bonus topics here. Um, for example, let's say you want to play with this a little bit and you're not quite sure. You can always store the last used render right here. This doesn't save the file. It just stores the render. If I click on this little picture frame right here, this picture stores a render. And it'll add a little slider at the bottom. And what that allowed me to do is like, oh, you know what? Maybe I'll come back in here, change this color to be a little bit more orange. Or maybe I'll make a light, like, like a light blue, and then I'll render again. And you see, I render. It's like, oh, that looks that looks okay. And then I'll store that render. So now I have two renders in, stored down here. And if I drag this slider down here, I can go back and forth by dragging the slider and compare before and after. Now these are temporarily saved. Um, they're not saved in as a file, but they're saved into memory. But if you were to have my crash on it, it would be gone. But if you like one over the other, then you can actually save it out as an image, or let's say, like, ah, I want to go back to the purple, or just actually change it back to the purple. And I'm going to see if I can undo back to that. Yes, I can. Control Z undo, and then render it again, just for that. Why not? And you can say, oh, okay, I, I do like this one better. So you can use the storing render, uh, pre um, render here to, to see previous renders and if you ever want to get rid of some you can come in here and, and just click on the one next to it to the right of it and this will actually delete previous renders if you don't want to save them if, if you start getting a lot in here you can actually delete some of them as well so that's just a, a, a useful tool in case you want to start comparing maybe different lighting situations things like that it's a great tool um, to use for that kind of stuff now let's say this is the one you want. This is the one I'm going to keep. This is the one I'm going to put on my web page and announce to the world how awesome, awesome I am at 3D uh, rendering. You go to File, Save Image. It'll open up a image uh, uh, dialog here, and you're going to um, want to save it out as a PNG or a JPEG. Please note if you save out as a PNG and you have empty background, i.e., back here. I'm going to store this render because I'm not sure if I did or not yet. If you save out a PNG, anywhere we see trans, this black right here, the background color, so the default color is black, that's going to be transparent. That means, you know, transparency. If you save it, save it out as a JPEG, a flattened image, that would be actual black. But if you save it out as a PNG, this would be transparent. You can use that for like film compositing, or maybe you want to put your own background in a program like Photoshop or another one out in there. But just note, if you save a PNG and you see this, this black background back there, that is transparent. All right. Um, for those that wonder how I switched my camera view like that, the bracket keys lets you move back and forth between camera views, uh, camera switches. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and save this out again to go back to the video. Save it out. File, save image. And you can see 
I, it's already, I already defaulted to PNG. Your settings up here on the top right, however, might say raw image. Now, there is nothing wrong with raw image. What it is, it's used by like image compositing, has a wider, wider range of gamut, um, so it doesn't try to color correct the image at all. That is the like, ideal way of doing stuff for like film, things like that. You give the control to the compositor that's making them. If you just want this view, this is a color managed view. You can see the little on symbol right there. It's being color managed in this view. So if you want this view to be exactly what you see when you open in a program like Photoshop or Preview, you need to switch yours from raw image to color managed. And these settings do save. You only need to change it once in your version of Maya probably, and you'll never have to do it again. Again, raw image is great for if, if you want to do like like a film animation type thing and, and have give more control at the compositing level. Um, so it's a more advanced feature that they made default um, in my. I'm not sure which version of my they made it default, but they switched it to be the default save option. So again, uh, that throws a lot of beginners off. Just if you want this, you want color managed image, which is most computers are going to try to color manage it in some way. So if you color manage it, you won't have to worry about that. It'll match. So make sure you click that. Make sure the file type is something that you're comfortable with, a PNG or or um, or uh, a JPEG or something like that. Give it a name. Render. I'm just going to call it Render. And I'm going to save it to the desktop. Now that I've saved that to the desktop, or you can save it anywhere you want, you can double click and open this in Preview. And you can see my image for the most part matches what I had in Maya. Um, and that's it. So you, that's how to render basic stuff with uh, Autodesk Maya um, using Maya software, as well as some of the you know um, basic lighting controls and shadows. Until next time, have a great day.